In this episode of the podcast, I want to take some time looking at what parents need to know from a legal perspective when signing their kids up for private school in Ontario. I have seen from comments on previous episodes, particularly the one about lack of required standards for Ontario private schools, that some people think that I am against private schools. That is not the case. I actually represent some of them. In our educational law practice, around half of our cases are on behalf of parents against private schools because the par- school did not meet the parents' expectations or told a child to leave without good reason or did not meet their children's needs. The reality is that Ontario private schools do not have the same curriculum, rules, or standards that Ontario public schools do. The Ontario government allows a lot more choice when parents choose a private education. That is precisely the reason why parents pick Ontario private schools. Some parents don't want their kids taking sex ed. Some don't like the anti-bullying component that is mandatory in public schools. Some parents want subjects taught with a religious focus. Some parents want schools that use permissible corporal punishment or other types of discipline that are not available in public schools. Some parents don't want their kids being taught alongside kids that have special needs or who are otherwise disadvantaged or students who face additional challenges that can divide a teacher's attention. Some parents want teachers with qualifications that are different from those required by the Ontario College of Teachers or want their children to have teachers that are not confined by the standards of practice and ethics opposed by that body. But before sending their child to an Ontario private school, Parents need to know what they are getting into, and in this episode, I will explain what parents need to know from a legal perspective before signing their child up for a private school. I'm John Schumann, a lawyer with 20 years experience practicing education law in Toronto. So let's talk about the education law that parents need to know when signing their child up for private schools. In choosing a private school, parents are choosing an education that is very different from that provided by public schools. I'm not going to talk about which is better because that largely depends on the specific school in either system. But what parents do not understand is that while it is not true that the Education Act does not apply to private schools at all, More than 95% of the Education Act does not apply to private schools. Further, the Ministry of Education does not regulate, license, or otherwise oversee the day-to-day operation of private schools. The Ministry does not even inspect elementary schools or high schools that do not grant Ontario secondary school diplomas, even if those schools provide other diplomas such as the IB program. The Ministry of Education provides a lot of direction to public schools about how they will operate. It does this through the Education Act government regulations, and policy and procedure memoranda that set out exactly how public schools must do things. In most, if not all, circumstances, those directions are rooted in the latest research into best teaching practices. In several areas, the expectations placed on public schools are considered to be the best in the world, but private schools are not required to follow them. To be clear, private schools do not have to follow the direction of the Ministry of Education on areas such as discipline, including suspensions, expulsions, or other forms of discipline, removing a child from his or her school, addressing the special needs of students, anti-bullying programs, specific curriculum content, student evaluation or testing procedures, communication with parents, participation in school activities, codes of conduct or dress code, vaccination or other health requirements, or record keeping, teaching or principal qualifications. If your child needs or would benefit from the specific standards or procedures set out by the Ministry of Education, then you may want to look at public schools and even what you have to do to get your child into a specific public school. If you don't think a public school will meet your child's needs, then it may be worth your while to talk to us about how to force public schools to do what the law requires them to do. Obviously, many private schools boast having standards that exceed the requirements expected of public schools, but there is no legislative or government requirement that a private school even meet the standards in public schools. The Ontario government is not going to step in to ensure that a child is being properly educated or properly treated at a private school, and it will only look at the curriculum content if the school wants to give the student an Ontario Secondary School Diploma. That does not mean that there are no legal requirements placed on private schools. Just that those legal requirements do not come from the government. Instead, they come from the contract that the parents sign with the school. Like with end user license agreements or apps on phones, 
parents tend to skip over those contracts, assuming that they have all some sort of standard terms, or that they relate only to payment of fees, or the other unimportant matters. But those contracts set out what education parents can expect their children to receive, and how the school will treat their children. Looking at specifics, one area we see a lot is private schools kicking kids out. As covered in a previous episode, there are a lot of rules that public schools have to follow if they want to kick a kid out, and they cannot just tell a kid that they cannot come to school anymore. That is in another episode. Click up there to watch it. Private schools don't have to follow any of those rules. Private schools can force a student to leave as set out in the contract. Most of the established private schools have contracts that essentially say, we can permanently remove any student from the school at any time for any reason, and we do not have to have a hearing or listen to the parents at all, and we do not have to refund any portion of the tuition. Parents usually just sign and agree to that. There are some schools that set up a procedure or say that they will mirror the requirements placed on public schools by the Education Act, or that students can only be ejected for violating the Code of Conduct. But most private schools do not and have contracts instead that allow them to complete discretion as to when to remove students. Most private schools can even remove a student who is a victim of bullying or other acts of violence because the victim does not fit in or the aggressor students are more desirable. Almost all private schools reserve the right not to readmit students for future academic years. That means they can literally just say in June that they don't want to see a student anymore in September. If parents do not like this possibility, they have to carefully read the contract and make sure they don't enroll at a school where the contract will allow things to happen that they don't like. And to be clear, I have done lots of cases where parents do not believe that their child would be removed from the school. This can be because they went to the school themselves, or they have other children who are at the school, or, or they cannot perceive any situation where a school would not want their child, or even because they have given the school a lot of money. I have seen lots of cases where parents were absolutely shocked to learn that their child is no longer welcome at a private school, and the school is using the terms of the contract against them. When parents come see us, we do have some remedies under contract law or human rights law, and some other strategies we can try to use to fix the situation. You can make an appointment by calling 416-446-5847, but the stronger the contract, then the more difficult and expensive it will be to try to fix things. So parents should review the contract carefully and use the code of conduct that is incorporated into the contract to make sure the contract meets their expectations and will not come back to haunt them if things go sour. I do understand that parents are often just glad that their child got accepted into a private school as it can be very competitive to get in and that it can be embarrassing when a child is not accepted into private school, particularly when it seems their child is not up to snuff or may have unique needs that is keeping them out. Private schools are private businesses, so they can choose who they serve and who they do not, unless that decision violates the Ontario Human Rights Code. But many private schools have complex, multi-stage admission processes that allow them to deny admission for reasons that are not related to a student's traits that would violate the Human Rights Code. So the last thing that most parents want to do is start questioning the terms of the contract when the school might just turn around and offer the place to another child. Still, I see many parents who are not happy with a private school and where that school failed to meet their expectations. Parents do need to carefully read the contract. If what it promises is different from what parents expect, they need to consider whether the school is the right one. It can be difficult to fight what a school is doing, even kicking a child out, if the school can point to the contract and say is allowed under the contract, or our contract doesn't require what you expect. If you find this information helpful, please hit the like button as it really helps us with this channel and helps other people find this information. Also remember, this is episode 84 and there's a lot of helpful advice in other episodes, so please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Giving out grades is one of the few areas where the Ministry of Education does have expectations of private schools, but not in a way that really assists parents. Private schools are required to have a policy about how they will communicate student achievement to parents, but how private schools communicate student achievement is entirely up to a private school. They can use the Ministry of Education standard report cards, but they do not have to do so. They do not even have to use formal grades. However, to grant a credit towards a course that will lead to an Ontario Secondary School Diploma, private schools must show that their evaluation of students is based on evidence of achievement of the, in the provincial curriculum expectations. 
It is conducted several times during a course and uses several methods for evaluating the student, as well as meeting other criteria. When it comes to challenging whether an evaluation of a student was fair or accurate, there is no direct way to challenge a private school's methodology. Many private school contracts specifically state that parents cannot and will not do that. Doing so will at best be difficult. Similarly, there are no direct ways to challenge a school's finding that a student has acted with academic dishonesty or challenge the method used in that investigation. Where a school makes such a finding and the imposed consequences are consistent with a code of conduct that has been incorporated into the contract with the parents, there is little that private school parents can do. If the consequences are severe for a student, they may want to consult with an education lawyer to see if there are any unusual or creative legal solutions available. One course of action that might be available where the school imposed a grade or discipline that did not take into account a student's special needs is to pursue a remedy based on human rights grounds. Ontario public schools have a refined process for identifying and providing assistance to kids. We have an episode about how to get that special assistance if a public school is not giving it to your child. While in most circumstances private schools cannot refuse to admit a student because that student has special needs, they often find other reasons to refuse admission. But once a student is in a private school, that school has to accommodate that child's special needs to the point where it will cause undue hardship. For very small, usually religious-based private schools that are not for profits and that charge very little for tuition and do not have much in the way of resources, the school may legitimately not be able to provide much accommodation for special needs. But larger schools can and must provide accommodation for students' special needs. People cannot contract out of the Ontario Human Rights Code, so it does not matter. If a private school has a disability or needs some other type of special treatment or services, the private school cannot refuse to provide those accommodations if it is reasonably able to provide them. Private schools cannot refuse to continue to teach a student because that student has special needs that the school could reasonably accommodate. While we often hear private schools say, our school doesn't do things that way, or our standards do not allow us to provide accommodation, the law says differently. Any parent faced with that sort of attitude should get advice from an education lawyer. One thing that can actually create special needs is a student being repeatedly bullied. Bullying can cause a lot of serious, long-lasting consequences and is rarely character building for the victim. It often leads to mental health problems that negatively impact a student's ability to learn and take away the benefit of attending a private school. As covered in episode 39, the Education Act and the Ministry of Education place a lot of legal obligations on public schools to prevent and address bullying. Those measures are based on the latest research into bullying and its effects. There is nothing in the legislation or from the Ministry of Education that requires private schools to do anything about bullying. Again, this is an intentional decision by government because some parents do not want their children exposed to anti-bullying programs and believe that bullying can be good for kids. They can choose to send their children to schools that allows or encourages bullying behavior, hazing, peers teaching each other lessons, or other similar behavior. Other private schools have very strict anti-bullying measures, some of which are modeled on what is required in public schools. Again, what a private school is legally required to do about bullying is set out in the contract with parents. But to a point, there can be legal consequences for a private school that allows bullying. When a school fails to supervise students properly, it can be liable for damages for mental or physical harm caused to a student. The law does not permit students or the student's parents to consent to the student being seriously harmed. So a school that says parents agree to let their child be bullied will not be successful with that position in court. In addition, many types of bullying, anything that is based on disability, race, ethnic origin, family status, sexual orientation, gender, or similar traits, is a violation of the Ontario Human Rights Code, so there can be penalties for institutions when bullying is also bigoted. Since bullying can have a lot of serious negative repercussions, it can lead to mental or physical disabilities. Once a child has such disabilities, the school is required to accommodate those challenges to the point of undue hardship. When those disabilities were caused by events at school, it is really difficult for a school to get away with saying that fixing a problem that was in part caused at the school will be too hard. Sometimes children run into trouble at private schools because one or more of their teachers or principals do not have any teaching qualifications and so do not know how to address certain educational situations or other issues.
Again, the Ontario government made a policy decision to allow a broader range of qualifications that are required to teach in the public system, so there are no minimal qualifications for private school educators or administrators. In addition, private school teachers do not have to be a member of the Ontario Colleges of Teachers. In fact, they can't be if they don't have the qualifications to get a teacher's license. And if a private school teacher is not a member of the College of Teachers, there is no body to complain to about the competence or ethics of that private school teacher. Some private schools do require their teachers to be members of the College of Teachers, but the private schools themselves are not required to use only licensed teachers unless their contract with the parents says so. It may be obvious from this episode that it is important for parents to read the contract with a private school, which often incorporates a code of conduct and other documents or policies before signing their child up to attend that school. Even if they feel they have no choice but to send their child to that private school, that contract tells them what they can expect, including the standards, if any, that will be applied to their child's education. There are no mandatory government standards for how children will be educated in private schools in Ontario or what quality of education they will receive. Parents can only hold a private school to the contract and perhaps human rights legislation if the school does not violate either of those, but the school does not meet the, the parents' obligations, then there will not be any government intervention and there can be few legal options even if a child suddenly finds him or herself without a private school to attend. Without any branch of government that will step in to assist, if you run into a problem with your child's private school, you will need to speak to a good education lawyer. You can reach us by calling 416-446-5847. If you need more information about education law and children's rights, or information about family law issues, check out www.humanlaw.ca. There are thousands of pages of legal information on that website, links to additional education law resources, and links to reach my office to meet with me or one of my colleagues. You can also set up an appointment to speak with us by calling 416-446-5847. It is always best to get a lawyer who can give you expert advice that's specific to your situation. In addition to my website, keep up to date on family and children's law issues by liking my Facebook page, following me on Twitter and on Mastodon at, at Schumann Family Law, and finding me on LinkedIn. Of course, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to stay up to date. Get the audio versions of the Ontario Family Law Podcast on all major podcast services such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and many more. Or you can get all the episodes at www.schumanlaw.ca. Just look for podcasts in the drop-down menu. Thanks for participating in this podcast. We will get together again soon.